Today on The Grave Talks, a conversation about the Octagon Hall Museum with museum director Bear Gaunt. The Octagon Hall Museum is a unique antebellum landmark in Franklin, Kentucky, and it's known for its Civil War history and its paranormal activity. Andrew Jackson Caldwell began building this unique family home in 1847. It isn't your typical home with four exterior walls. This home is built with eight walls, making it octagon shaped. The construction wasn't completed until 1859. During the Civil War, it was occupied at different times by both the Confederate Army and the Union Army. The Octagon Hall has also been a Masonic temple, a hospital, and is regarded as one of the most haunted places in the South. Over the years, there's been more than 1,000 paranormal teams investigating this unique building. There are many stories of the ghosts that still haunt the building, from the Caldwell family, slaves, Confederate, and Union soldiers who have all never left the property. I'm Carol Hughes, and on this episode of The Grave Talks, the history and the hauntings of the Octagon Hall Museum with Bear Gaunt. Hey, Bear, how are you doing today? Hey, Carol. Such a pleasure to be with you on Grave Talks. I'm really excited to have you here today. This is going to be a very interesting conversation. Now, what's sure. your background as museum director? Were you planning on getting involved with a place known for paranormal ha- hauntings? Did your background prepare you for that? I've been a paranormal investigator for 47 years. Okay, so yes, your background yeah. com- uh, my prepared, background me. <laughs> prepared me for that. I've been doing it for a long, long time. started when I was about 20. I, I had a, a great opportunity. I was a, a radio host on a... Uh, uh, radio show, and I did uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, and they wanted me to go interview an interesting guy called Hans Holzer. And uh, I did go do that, and uh, I had a really nifty Marantz double deck recorder. I don't know if you've ever <laughs> yes, that old, yes. if you've ever seen one of those antique pieces. But uh, and his sound guy couldn't go, and I went with him to uh, the first time. That's where I got. Uh, uh, the bug, if you will, and then it expanded into UFOs, everything else, uh, cryptos, uh, you name it, if it's paranormal. In fact, I don't even call myself a paranormal investigator anymore. I like to use the term, I'm a supernaturalist. <laughs> well, and this is a good job for you then, because you have all of that there at the Octagon yeah, Hall yes, Museum. Yeah, we sure do. We sure do. And, you know... Um, when we're talking about paranormal, one of the key factors about the paranormal is the history, researching. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got to be able to, if you're a really good paranormal investigator, you've got to love history because the locations you're going has that history to it. And you want to research, you want to know who it is. And even if you're doing uh, just normal Hunts where you're going to help out a family that has a problem and you're you're giving them that uh, assistance that's needed to verify a haunting or to clear a house or whatever. You know, you've got to be able to get your get down and do the deep research about the place so you know exactly mm-hmm. what's been going on there because yeah. it makes a big difference. Now this building has some very interesting history, speaking of history. <laughs> yes, it does. Just to start with. It's not just four walls. It's octagon shaped. So think of a stop sign. And right, exactly. It yeah. was, but I, they yeah. started building it in 1847, was it? 1847 is what we use. And um, we'll get into it. I'll just go, yeah, 1847. Uh, that's what the, uh, when it first became on the historical sites in uh, in, in Kentucky here. That was in uh, 1963. They used um, 1947, and when it became on the National Register of Historic Places in 80, uh, they used the same information. So that's what we use. And um, the house wasn't fully completed until 1859. The reason why it wasn't completed all the way, they were living in the house uh, a lot earlier. The situation was is that it is a brick structure. Andrew Jackson Caldwell, the builder of the house, uh, was afraid of storms when he was younger. So what Andrew did was he wanted to fortify his home. 
So he put three rows of brick around the outside of his oh, house. Oh, wow. And so after the first row of bricks go up, of course, you've got a structure, but he put three rows on top of it. And it, it's, it really holds in, uh, it's as sturdy as can be. It's 176 years old this year. Uh, and it is just a uh, wonderful, wonderful place to, to come and visit uh, for, we have people that do historical tours and everything else. But uh, yeah, the house, all the brick were made there on site and fired on the site and then put on the house. So this has not been used only as a private residence. It's been a number of things over the years, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, Carol, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Andrew was a uh, 33rd degree mason. And uh, he uh, built the house. Um, you know, octagons were popular uh, back in the uh, a gentleman by the name of Flower. Uh, an architect in the Northeast wrote a book in like 49, I think. And then he rewrote it again in the 50s and it became very popular. Uh, but I think Andrew was a little bit ahead of that curve. And uh, one of the things that's cool to think about is that an octagon-shaped building and an octagon is one of the most sacred symbols to a Masonic member. Oh. And he did hold Masonic uh, meetings in that house. So uh, when Masons come into it today, they're like going, oh, you told Mason lived here. <laughs> they don't tell you very much, but <laughs> I will tell you that it's... Yeah, they don't tell you everything about that organization. No, not at all, not at all. But, you know, the house structure itself uh, is quite interesting. It has six windows on each floor. All the four of the windows are at an angle, kind of like that, and... Uh, uh, at the corners of the house. And then there are two on each floor, That one on the uh, south side and one on the north side of the house. Um, the door is set east and west. So he wanted to kind of keep that compass motif. So he made the front rooms a little bit larger than the back rooms. Uh, so just to accommodate, be able to do that. But the cool thing and the weird thing about it is to tell you what this guy was thinking and how he thought. Each of those corner windows that are at an angle are set there and purposely built that building and set that there for those windows to be looking directly to the solace and the equinoxes. So if you're standing in one window, you will, on December 23rd, you're looking at the winter equinox. And if you're looking at another window, you're looking at spring. And if you're at another window, you're looking at summer. And another window, you're looking at fall. And it goes all the way up the house. So that way. So wow, it's, it's pretty interesting that he does that. that you know, another freaky thing that, he did yeah. in the house, you know, uh, I don't know anybody that uh, has ever done it, but uh, there's what they used to call old protection doors. And uh, uh, they make a cross in the center of them. They're very detailed, but uh, they make a cross actually in the middle of it. That house has all upside down cross doors in it. Oh, really? He put all hung all the doors upside down. During the Civil War, the family's living in it, correct? And oh, yes. And it was mm -hmm. taken over at one point by the Confederate soldiers and another point by the Union soldiers. All in a camped quick, there. short while. And let me explain that to you. You know, the tragedy that happened in the house, uh, Caldwell's first wife. Elizabeth Akers called while well. she was um, uh, instrumental in the start of the house, but unfortunately she doesn't get to live there very long. Uh, she dies of typhoid fever at the age of 30. Lizzie, as we call her, was um, born three children to Andrew. And those three children, the first one lives to be uh, an adult way into her 80s. And then the other two uh, pass there in the home. Uh, one downstairs, a little girl downstairs in the basement. She catches on fire and burns. Uh, doesn't die right away, lives seven days after and joins mom outside. And then the second child was a boy, and he was the first Andrew Jackson Caldwell Jr. And when he uh, passes, he's playing up on the staircase and falls down and breaks his neck. And then Andrew marries again in 1854. And he marries Harriet Morton Caldwell, and 
uh, they're only together for 12 years. Harriet and uh, Andrew have 11 children in 12 years. Uh, only seven of them make it to adulthood. Andrew dies in 1866, right after the war, right before his last daughter was born. Uh, she was born three months after he died, so he never got to see her. And then Harriet is the one that stayed there the longest in the house. She runs the house from that time. From she was there from 1854 all the way until 1920 and uh, 1918, until she sells the house. Oh, she was there a long time. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, she does some weird stuff too. We'll get into that later. Well, <laughs> Ask me about that so later. she would have been there when the soldiers from both sides took over the home. Yes, because yes. they would and do so was that. Andrew. Andrew was there also, yeah. Yeah. and they would do that back in the day. They're in traveling and on foot, oh, yeah. going point A to point B, and they would just take over somebody's house and use it as a headquarters for a bit. Well, you know, this Kentucky is steeped in Civil War history, so it was Tennessee. And Kentucky was neutral back then, you know. So we had a an opportunity here that uh, Kentucky is very north and very south. You know, you got Louisville and Lexington up north, and you've got the Bowling Green area down south. The Bowling Green uh, area was known as the state uh, capital of the Confederacy, basically. And uh, they were uh, very heavy uh, in that area. Uh, Grant takes a uh, a group of people and goes over towards the land of the lakes area over where Fort Donaldson is and defeats the Confederates. And then he sends word that he wants the Confederates out of Bowling Green. So they start a rally around Bowling Green. They don't have a battle there. They put out artillery and shell it for three days. And that that terrible shelling sends the Confederates running out and heading south towards Tennessee. Bowling Green's about 30 miles from uh, Tennessee. It's about uh, 18 miles, 20 miles from the house that uh, Octagon Hall, and it's about 12 miles from there to the border. So, And they were used to marching about 20 miles a day, so it was, an, it was a perfect march. And people always go, well, why did they pick the Octagon Hall? Well, there was three plantations right there, Carol, and those three plantations were very close together. They all had an enormous amount of land, 1,500 acres apiece. Really funny thing about it is the captain who was bringing them down that way uh, in the uh, Kentucky 9th Cavalry, his name was John Caldwell, oh. and he was Andrew Jackson Caldwell's nephew. So he oh. knew he knew of the house. So he brings 9,000 Confederate soldiers there. I can't even wrap my brain around what that would look like. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was a mass of humanity. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them were wounded from the shelling, and then they had to uh, uh, set up, uh, if you will, triage uh, in the basement. That's when the house first becomes a hospital, and okay. not much uh, hospitaling was done back then. They didn't mm -hmm. have the kind of stuff we had. They had one thing that they liked to do to people uh, because they were afraid of infections. And to save their life, what would they do? they cut something off. So if you had a wound on your arm or your hand or your foot or your leg, chances are they were going to cut it off, cauterize it, and that would stop it from... Uh, spreading the infection uh, that would uh, could kill you. And there wasn't a, really, it sounds brutal, but there wasn't a lot of options for them. At that time, you're in the middle no, of nowhere. No, we didn't have any, you know, we didn't have penicillin, didn't have the kind of stuff that we had. And, and the bad thing about it is you've heard of the old story, bite the bullet or bite the piece of leather. That's what well, they, they didn't do. have anything like that to knock you out either. I'm sure the whiskey ran hot real quick, you know, but uh, we have, bone piles we have a lot of uh, burial sites there people that uh, didn't survive that and people that died on the trip uh, to uh, the octagon hall the confederates didn't stay there very long though they were there to, they were gone the next afternoon uh what they did is they left their wounded behind and they wanted to get down to tennessee and they were going to split their forces and go to shiloh and to uh, nashville to guard it two days after that the union came there and they had 5,000 men with them. They 
dispatched all of the Confederate soldiers. Now we have mass graves on the property. Brutality happened within the whole area. They raped, pillaged, and everything. Stayed there for a week and a half before they went under Franklin and did the same carnage down there, just south of uh, uh, the home. So it was a terrible time. My grandfather was, I bet, mm -hmm. w with the Union soldiers there because he went on to the Battle of Franklin. Oh, so yeah, okay. I, I yeah. bet he was with them because there was a big battle in Franklin. Wow, that kind of made it personal to me right there. I didn't know I had a personal <laughs> connection, but I'll just bet money that he was with them since he went with them to Franklin. Then went on to Nashville, and that was his last battle with them. Well, a little bit later, if you want to give me his, or their name after we get done with this interview, I'll I'll see if I can find some information for you. I will absolutely do that. I would absolutely Excellent. do that. Excellent. So then they used it as a hospital for a time. A civil Afterwards, war, I'm assuming, hospital, or was it after? Well, they, and they kept it that way because of the fact that what was happening is, is that after the after everything that was terrible had happened, I mean, the Union poisoned as well. They took all their all was capital. They they left them deep dark. They didn't care. Uh, so what they, I mean, that's war. You know, that's what they do. And people aren't aware of that. They, 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 they lose that sense of some of the things that happen in war. It's just terrible. You right. Know, you but, think it's all honorable but, and they're fighting for the cause right. and bad things happen. Bad things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the house, uh, Andrew becomes a real super a guy who says, uh, hey, now I'm a super uh, sympathizer for the South. And he uh, offers the house as a safe house. So if you're a Confederate soldier and you're doing anything against the Union Army, you want to get the Andrew Jackson Caldwell's house. And he would hide you, he'd feed you, he'd give you medical attention, and the Union knows about this. So they would send their sick people up to him to keep an eye on him so that they would be able to know what was going on. But in the meantime, he was hiding people on the walls, down in the basement. He, has, he had a tunnel in the house, and he would use that tunnel. And then he also helped all the guerrilla activity. Uh, there's an interesting picture that I sent you that was just taken a little while ago. Back in April of 1863, Andrew derails his first train. There's a train track that runs through Auntie and Hall. It's the old Louisville, Nashville. Andrew uh, was instrumental in kind of bringing that line down, in, uh, down through there and in, into the Nashville area. But what he does is he, he takes it a... a Step further, he he burns that train and de he derails it and burns it, and and he takes the bell off of it, and we have the bell sitting at the back porch. Uh, he brought that home as a souvenir. He put it in the ground in 1863, and it's still standing there today at the, uh, at our back porch. And I think home since 1863. Yep, isn't that something? And yeah, but there's a picture there of. A group of people that said they saw a train that didn't make any noise. Train track still used. Uh, it's a freight system, but this was, uh, they said it was a passenger train. Uh, they don't put passenger trains on that line. Uh, in fact, uh, you can ask me a funny story if you want to later about it, because I had a guy from uh, CSX who owns that line now, who was a big wig there, touring the house, and uh, he had a... Uh, an epiphany about haunts <laughs> while he was there. <laughs> and uh, he saw a train also that was a passenger. Uh, so these things appear and disappear, but uh, this one happened to be on fire. And if you look at the picture and zoom in on that picture that I sent you, you may be able to see that uh, the train is definitely on fire and burning. Oh, I'm zooming in, yeah. Yeah, you sent some creepy pictures. <laughs> There's one really, like when I was... Researching the house, I like to do my own little digging around about it. And there are so many videos out there with investigators. You and I were talking about it a few minutes ago. Uh -huh. There are hundreds of videos of things that people and pictures that people have caught while they're doing investigations or taking a tour of the Octagon Hall Museum. Oh, yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. It is an amazing place for the paranormal. It, it really, uh, really is. You know, it's in uh, 
uh, back when we were just talking about before the show, I mentioned to you about the 37th parallel. Which I didn't know anything about. You know, the 37th parallel is, is it's a parallel that goes around the, around the world. And most of the paranormal activity is, is highly helped in that area. And it's also known as the UFO highway. So we get a whole kinds of different kinds of things there. Um, I always say the Octane Hall is ancient property. There are, uh, it's down to about 300 acres now. Uh, we uh, sublease some of that off and we take care of about 10 acres around it. But people have seen uh, UFOs, aliens. Uh, people have witnessed art, well, very strange lights and movement of lights. Uh, they have experienced what they consider to be like a Mothman creature. They have seen uh, Bigfoot. They have seen Dogmen and other creatures that I don't think anybody's ever heard of, but they describe them to me and I go, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new one. Yeah. So I don't want to see that one. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, it's also Rake. Rake have been seen on the property. Uh, most of the things I happen to witness because I'm there uh, a lot and I spend a lot of time there at the hall. And we also do maintenance out there and try to do things to keep it to keep it up. And uh, so it's, it's it it is a busy little place. Do you think that Mr. Caldwell, because it seems to be very precise in the way he built the house with the windows all looking in a certain direction. Do you think that was just a coincidence that he built right there? No. No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, I'm going to tell you right now. It was one of those places that uh, he knew exactly what was there. That property is ancient, what we call ancient property. Palo Indians were on that property 3,000 years ago. There are mounds around the area. There are all these signs of... um, old ancient things happening there and then you put it together where we're south of mammoth cave and mammoth cave is the largest cave system in the world in simpson county where we're at uh there are 35 cave systems that have never that are that are noted to be there only five of them have been explored uh when you look at mammoth cave only three percent of mammoth cave has been explored and some of the things that they say and found in Mammoth Cave. So who knows what's running around underneath of us? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, plus we have, uh, it's on limestone. Uh, uh, when you have a cave system, we have a sinking creek that's above the ground. Not only is there the house on the property, but you have barns and outbuildings there as well. And I'm, yes. by looking at the pictures that you sent, Obviously, mm-hmm. there's, and what you just had said about the train, there's obviously <laughs> more paranormal. Going on too. <laughs> that's just, yeah, it's going on outside of the house as well. Yeah. UFOs, that's, cryptids, all of it. You know what's funny? And Carol, I'll tell you, I tell people all the time that, you know, they up there and they, they ask about it. And I said, you know, they'll say, how many spirits are in the house? And, you know, most people say, like, Oh, there's the kids, and maybe mom and dad are there, but maybe eight people in the house. And I go, uh, in my estimation, I would say there's probably about 200. Uh, there's probably about 400 walking the property outside. <laughs> and so you never know who you're going to get or what you're going to get. I'll never forget. I, I said that in front of my, I've got a new docent that uh, tours the house and everything. He's been there about a, year, well, a little over a year now. And when I said that, he laughed because he was listening to what I was telling people and he laughed. And today, uh, he'll tell you there's 300 uh, spirits in the house. (laughs) (laughs) So this is a really, really active, not just house, but property. Yes. Like all around it. Extremely active. And you have, like I mentioned earlier, you know, a thousand investigations over the years. You don't even have a number for it, really. There's just constant uh, really, investigations. I, uh, really, I don't. You know, I mean, like I said last year, we had 187 people there. We've been giving tours. We opened in 2001. We didn't know the place was haunted. Uh, Billy Bird was, it was an epiphany of him. He, uh, Billy was uh, the historical director 
uh, here in Franklin, uh, Kentucky. And then he goes to, uh, uh, he spent seven years doing that. He had a Sutbury, a Sutbury uh, on the main square right down from where I live. And uh, he has an epiphany one night. He goes, hey, wouldn't it be cool to turn the Ontigan Hall into a museum? And so he uh, uh, continues that venture. And uh, here we come out. And uh, that's the beginning of Ottingen Hall. And uh, now the Ottingen Hall is owned by the Ottingen Hall Foundation. It's a 501c nonprofit. And uh, we don't get any money from city government. All we're doing is just uh, trying to extend the history because we think history is so important. And people mm-hmm. need to know the history about, about things. But Billy is out. Billy is there, and he is on a ladder, fixing a light fixture, and uh, he has an encounter with a little girl. Uh, he thought, well, maybe somebody came in there, and the little girl's out running around the house. Where's your mom at? Are you okay? Uh, what's going on? Doesn't say a thing to him. Walks down the hallway. He says, full body just like a regular human, and then just goes, turns into a bunch of gnats. Just went, poof. Oh, wow. But yeah. it was so real to him that he's like, where's your mom? Uh, you, girl, know? I can't tell you. you know what's the funniest thing for me to do? Is I sit there and I, people will come in the house and I want to get a tour and they go, oh my gosh, it's so cool. You got reenactors out here. And I'm going, we do? <laughs> Where? You know, because... No reenactors. We don't have reenactors out there, but people will see them walking in. They'll say they'll tip their hats to them. They may wow. wave at them, and they'll see them walk into a building. And they come in, and the first thing they go is like, oh, that's so cool you got reenactors. And I'm like, well, we don't have any reenactors here. <laughs> people take pictures of outside the of the house and the windows, and they see people looking back outside at them. Uh, from there, they get uh, there's so many photos, so many things uh, about the hall, and uh, I just got a bunch of them. Uh, every time there's a team there, normally else I get a ton of pictures. Uh, they'll they'll say something to me about it, but I've taken so many myself, and I've witnessed so many things that uh, uh, it's just uh, one of those places that people, the real paranormal investigators, just love love to come there. They'll have a team there this week that's been there for 17 years in a row. And they probably get something different every time. Yes. And you know what? One of the greatest things about it is those are the people that I can actually talk about. We can have a conversation about all the things that I've seen and all the things that they've seen, and they match up. And uh, so we, we're not freaking anybody out. So we're just like sitting there going, can you believe that? We saw that. We saw that. Oh, my, oh my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So... Uh, yeah, it's a uh, PGRI out of uh, uh, Chattanooga area. So, yeah, it's great, uh, great team. Let's and, talk uh, about some of those things that you've seen there. The little girl, I'm just assuming, is she the little girl who was burned? So well, there's severely? a lot of kids there. Uh, mm-hmm. But, uh, yes, I would assume that uh, uh, Mary Elizabeth was her name. Uh, is in the house, but there's other ones that are in the house also, uh, several of them. Uh, remember, there were three plantations there. Uh, mm-hmm. During the Civil War, it displaced a lot of families. So what would you do if you were a humanitarian type person and you've got the area? You're going to take care of all these kids. Oh, I never even everywhere. thought about that. So they're there around the property and in the house and everything else. Uh, and we don't know a lot of the history of it. You know, one of the greatest problems here in this area is when Simpson County was made into a, uh, into a county in, in, in 1812. One of the odd things about it that happened, Carol, is that things go on, the war happens, everything else. And then all of a sudden, in May of 1882, the four counties that made up Simpson County and gave them land all their courthouses burn, including Simpson counties. In the, the same, same year? <laughs> same year, same month. That had to have been somebody setting a fire. Somebody, there are some records well, that exactly, somebody didn't exactly. want so them to know. Like going, 
Well, somebody who's living around after 1882 made one hell of a, a land grab. That's yeah. what I'm figuring. <laughs> wow. And because back then that was paper. Once the paper was gone, it was gone. It's not backed oh, up yeah. on a hard drive. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of things have you seen in the house? And things, maybe some interesting. <laughs> <laughs> As he laughed. Well, <laughs> some you know, interesting remember, things uh, other people have discovered. You know, it's funny when you say that because people always go, uh, you know, even doing paranormal investigations so long, you don't get scared. You don't get a bull crap. Uh, you know, I got to tell you something. I was sitting there one day and I was working on a string of lights and I was putting them all together and everything else. I had them in my hand and I'm looking at them. I'm working on a table. And the next thing I know, I hear this weird noise and I'm walking around and I'm going like, what the heck is that? And I get up out of my chair. Now, mind you, i got to explain it one more time. I've got a broken foot at the time. So I get up. I'm looking at I, I'm holding this thing. I have my hand I'm looking at and I'm looking around going, that is really weird. And all of a sudden I turn and I look and what do I see? I see a silver war soldier with half his head blown off. And he is just next to me and his hands are reaching out to my neck. And I turned around and went, I should never forget what. I did like the chicken dance. And unfortunately, we have cameras and all. So we didn't catch the guy that I saw, but we did catch me doing a chicken dance, which I immediately paid people off so that they would never see <laughs> So that video is gone. <laughs> Do you think he was reaching out to get you, or was it just something? It was not a happy feeling. I have felt all kinds of, you know, being an investigator for as long as I have. And knowing the the feelings that you have in uh, in homes and whatever, this was not a this was not a friendly hug. And have you experienced that kind of energy at other times while you've been there? Yes, yeah. There's there are people uh, that come to the hall that will not go in the basement. There are people that will not go upstairs. There are people that don't like to go out into the cemeteries. There's people that don't like to go, you know, so it's it's that way. I've experienced so many different things. Uh, I have seen UFOs. I have seen the weird lights. Uh, the hall has portals on it. We were outside that uh, it was this year. It was early in the year. Uh, we were outside and uh, we were in the slave cemetery. And we were doing uh, EVP sessions, and the light, uh, the ground turned wh whitish blue in the field. Odd feeling came over everybody, and the next thing you know, out comes a weird creature out of the ground. What? And then shoots right back down to the ground. <sighs> yeah, we have portals there. We have doorways that open, doorways that close. Um, a lot of people have seen the portals. A lot of people have seen these type of things. Uh, there's a lot of ley lines uh, that run through there. So, you know, in certain parts of the country, there are these odd things that weird things happen in. Mm -hmm. you know? And I would say the Ottingen Hall property is just one of those places that uh, through history for many, many years, odd things have happened there. And they continue to happen there all the time. And that wraps up part one of our conversation about the Octagon Hall Museum with museum director Bear Gaunt. Make sure you listen to part two, where we talk about even more hauntings. For more information about tours and paranormal investigations, go to their website, octagonhallmuseum.com. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advanced episodes, everything commercial free, become a gravekeeper. Sign up on Apple Podcasts and you can try it three days free. You can also go to patreon.com slash the grave talks and find everything there. It's also ad free. For all of us at the Grave Talks, I'm Carol Hughes. Thank you so much for listening.